everybody, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. I have moved into a new desk and so you might see some boxes behind me because I'm not all unpacked. You might, might also hear a little bit of extra noise going on um, since I'm not in an office anymore and, and that's okay. Hopefully it means you can still hear me, um, but we'll see how it goes and if not next week we'll move into um, a conference room if we can. Today we are talking about getting around the missing 1890 census. For those of you who are new to family history, you may not be aware that the 1890 census uh, was destroyed. Uh, there was a fire in the Commerce Building in 1921 and about 25% of the census burned and then about another 50% of it was destroyed by smoke damage and water damage. And so a decision was made in the 1930s to, um, to just eliminate the rest of it. And so we don't have access to that. There are a few fragments that survive and have um, found their way into some different places, but for the most part it's completely missing. And so that means for those of us who um, use census records as the foundation for building our family trees, that there's this huge gap between 1880 and 1900. And that gap can make a significant difference in the research that we do. So today we're just going to talk about a couple of quick ways that we can get around that missing 1890 census. For some of you, um, this is going to be a huge help. For some of you, it might be a little bit more challenging and require a little bit more creativity. But hopefully in the next 15 or 20 minutes that we spend together, you'll get some ideas for ways to work around that. Okay? So the first thing that you're going to want to do is be aware that there are state census records. Many states take census rec take censuses um, in the on the fives, right? So the federal census is in the United States is taken on the tens. The state censuses generally are taken on the fives. A lot of those have been digitized and made available on Ancestry.com. I will show you how to access those and which states are available online. Again, um, for those of you who've been with me, you know that one of my favorite resources on Ancestry.com is the card catalog. So if you just hover over your search button, the card catalog is going to be the very bottom option there. Click on card catalog and that will take you to a listing of all 30,000 plus databases that are held on our website. Now I'm going to show you a few things here that might be a little bit difficult to see if you're watching this video in a small screen. Um, I get that complaint sometimes and so I just want to make you aware if you're watching this live on live stream, hover over the middle of the video and you should see an option to make this video full screen. If you're watching it on YouTube as an archived version, usually that is going to be in the bottom right hand corner uh, of the video screen. Just make it full screen so that you can see what we're doing here. Now, um, the way that we're going to find these state censuses, or the quickest way we're going to find them, is in the title field, I just want you to type state census and click search. What that's going to do is it's going to take that list of 30,000 plus databases down to 36. Now, the default sort on these records is always going to be popularity. I would recommend that you just change that to database title, and what you'll see then is that these records end up sorted in alphabetical order by state. Now you can see that there are quite a few um, state census records, but remember for this purpose we're particularly interested in the 1885 and 1895 censuses. So we're just going to scroll through this list here and see if we can't find um, some that fit that category. Now right off the bat Michigan gives us an anomaly. Michigan actually takes their censuses on the fours. So we'll see an 1884 and an 1894 and then moves on to 1904. So that's the one anomaly here. But then you start to see some of these others. Colorado, Florida. Let's look at Florida as our first example. When you get to a state census or any database page on Ancestry.com, one of the first things I recommend is that you always scroll past that search box and read the database description. What that tells you, first of all, is where Ancestry.com received that data. In this case, we received it from the National Archives. Scroll past that and you're going to see information about exactly what is included in this index. In the case of Florida, you'll see here, we have um, 1867, 1875, 1885, that's the year that we're interested in, and you'll notice that it says all counties that existed at the time except four, and then we have um, four counties listed here that are not, for whatever reason, included in this particular census. And so that's important information to be aware of before you start searching, because if your ancestor lived in Clay County or Columbia County, um, you know, we don't want you frustrated looking for them if that record doesn't even exist here. Then you'll notice um, these other years here 
that all counties are included. Below that, we also list exactly what um, was included or what information was asked and indexed on that particular census. You'll also see here a particular note about the 1885 census. Um, and in this case, it just is telling us that the population schedules are the only thing that have been included or provided by the government here. So that's the Florida State Census. And you'll notice this database covers a broad range of years, 1867 to 1945. But if you're searching for just the 1885 census, you can limit your search results to just 1885 by typing that into this any event box and marking exact. And then when you do a search, it will only show you results for the 1885 census. If you forget to do that, when you get to your search results page, just pay attention to the fact that there's this census year listed here, and you can see exactly which year of census it is that you're looking at. We're going to scroll down through this list of state census databases and take a look at one other state census here. I want to take a look at the New York State Census collection. So New York State Census, if you'll scroll down again past the search box, You'll see the source information. Um, this actually came from the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, um, is where we obtained the microfilm. You'll then see, uh, again, a database description. Now, this particular census for the state of New York was taken in 1892, so again, a little bit of an odd year. Um, and it says here that there's only 364,000 records for that particular year. And the reason is, rather than excluding a, a few counties here, for this particular census, there are only records available for a few counties. Um, I didn't count them, but you can see here just a handful of those counties. So if your family is from one of those counties, great. If they're not, again, um, we don't want you frustrated by searching for them thinking, oh, of course they're going to be in here. So read these database descriptions. They're really, really valuable. Now let's actually do a search in this New York State Census. We're going to be looking for John Marsh. John was born about 1850. And again, I'm searching um, for him in the 1892 census. So I'm going to mark that exact so that that's the only search results that I receive is our, for that particular census. Here's John. He comes up right at the top. He's living in Ger German Flats in Herkimer County. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. You'll see here the, the index record um, page then you have the original image. So for this particular state census, we have original images available. Please, please, please take advantage of those. You'll find that there's a lot more information on the image, as well as some contextual information that you can glean that's not included in the index. The purpose of the index is just to get you to the record, um, and then the record is what provides you with additional information and a full picture um, and story about your ancestor. Now, um, different Here's the, here's the challenge with state census records, or one of them anyway. Um, federal censuses are uniform, right? So the 1900 census, for the most part, most enumeration districts use the exact same form across all the country. But state censuses varied. They varied by year. Sometimes they varied by county. Um, and oftentimes they don't look exactly like what we would expect a census record to look like. Now, this particular one ran across two pages, but the record itself is only on one page. So it's been double um, imaged, um, the original microfilm, but sometimes the full record runs across both pages. So what I like to do is just set my image to fit width so that I can get a full look at this particular image so that I know what I'm dealing with. And then I'll start to zoom in and see if I can't figure out exactly what these columns mean, um, what information is included in the header up here about the date that it was taken and, and um, the enumeration district and the town. Zoom in a little bit further and even maybe use this magnify tool to um, make the column headers a little bit bigger so that I know exactly what questions were asked so that I know what all that data means. And always remember to scroll across um, the page, right? In this case, there's only a few columns here. It's just these first few columns. And then this is a second enumeration, or a, another set of enumeration, and another and another. So we've actually got four columns of data on this one image. 
But in some cases, like I said, um, it could go across the whole page or it could go cr across the entire image. So make sure you read those column headings so that you understand what it is that you're looking at. And then of course, once you figure all of that out, you're gonna want to look for your person on this image. And here we find John Marsh, he's down at the bottom. I'm gonna blow this up just a little bit more so that we can see this. As a matter of fact, I can go pretty big here because um, it is such a small column. Here we have John. Now, in this particular case, the New York State Census, they didn't enumerate the relationship to the head of household. They didn't even really enumerate um, household delineations. They didn't make delineations. They just listed the last names of the people, and um, hopefully we can assume that this is a family. Of course, it would require further research, but, um, but that's a good clue that that's what's going on here. They also asked the country, in this case, the country where they were born, rather than the state, so that's not as helpful, but what we can see are things like this. Um, we see uh, George Marsh here. George Marsh is seven years old in 1892. So George was not included in the 1880 census. The same with his older brother, William. William was actually born in late 1880, so he was not included in the 1880 census. And by 1900, George had passed away and William had gotten married and moved out of his family's household. So if we hadn't found this particular census, we might not have even known that there were children named William and George in this family because of that 20 year gap. So those are the kinds of things that you're looking for when you start to fill in the gaps um, with the state census records between 1880 and 1900. So just a quick review here um, of the state censuses that are available and have been digitized and put online. The first one is Colorado for 1885. The second one is Florida for 1885. We have Iowa for 1885 and 1895. We have Kansas for 1885 and 1895. There's that Michigan with that kind of odd years, 1884 and 1894. Nebraska in 85, New Jersey in 1895, New York in 1892, and South Dakota in 1895. So if your ancestors um, came from or passed through any of those states in the 1880s or 1890s, this is a really great resource for you and I hope you'll take advantage of it. The second resource that I use most often to fill in the gap around the 1890, missing 1890 census um, is city directories. Ancestry.com has tons and tons of city directories that have been digitized and placed online. However, getting to them sometimes is, um, you know, they don't surface really high in general search results. So again, the best way to get to them is going to be through that card catalog, knowing what you're looking for and going directly to the city directories. Now, the best way to do that when you're in your, I just reset filters for those of you who didn't know what I just did, um, is when you're in your card catalog, again, you've got these 30,000 plus databases, rather than typing something in the title or the keyword field, I would actually scroll down here to these filters and use them. We do have a category here for schools, directories, and church histories. So click on that, and then you'll see another filter here for city and area directories. Go ahead and click on that. And then you can filter by country. We're gonna to go to US. And then you can filter by state. So there's over a thousand directories just in city directories just in the United States. So I would recommend filtering by state where it's possible. Or another option you can do is you can actually filter by decade. So I can come down here and I can say, you know what, I want all city directories that have data from the 1890s. And you'll notice that that list of 1,000 drops down to 427. A little bit more manageable, but again, I would probably filter it even further down by state. Now you'll see if I go to Georgia, I'm going to end up with a list of six directories. I can sort those however I need to, and then I can look and see if any of them might contain information that, have, that could be pertinent for me. So this particular um, directory for Atlanta for 1889 and 1890 is probably the most interesting to me. Um, again, scroll past that search box, read that, that source information and that database description so that you know what it is that you're looking at. It sometimes also gives you some really helpful information that might help in further research. Now, um, one of the problems with um, city directories or one of the challenges with city directories is that often it's just the head of household or the employed that are listed still really, really useful, but it's not going to list every member of the household. 
So when I come in here and I do a search for George Lawrence, um, he is not coming up. But we do see John Lawrence here living on Howell, and that is actually a relative. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. What you're going to see is you're going to see a um, street address. If, if it's a business, it'll list the name of the business, um, what kind of an occupation it was, and then the year, because this particular database contains both 1889 and 1890. That gives you some really great information to work with. Now, if I had found his home address, which I believe, um, well, it says R, so it's a residence, um, I can actually copy that. And then when I search, when I go back to search, I can place that street name in the keyword field or the location field. Say, I want to see only Lawrence's who are living on Strong, living on that particular street. And then we'll get just those results. So it's a way to search for um, other family members or other families, um, parents, siblings, cousins that might be living in the same neighborhood or on the same street or employed uh, by the same company, which oftentimes you'll find is very, very common. So that's just one of the ways that I use city directories. Again, you find those in the card catalog. I would filter by um, a decade and a location to get a more manageable list to see what it is that you're looking for. Check out those database descriptions and then um, get as much information out of it as you can and then maybe try a different kind of a search like the street name and a surname to see what other family members might be living in the area. So that is how I use city directories. So again, state censuses and city directories are probably the two most useful tools for getting around that missing 1890 census. One little bonus tip that I'll just give you that I also use quite a bit. If I found a family in the 1900 census and I'm trying to um, locate them in the 1880 census and I'm having a hard time doing it, pay really close attention to the birthplaces of the children in the household. One of the most challenging things I've found is that sometimes families moved and so they're not in the same place in the 1880 census. And if I track the birthplaces and the years of those children, I'll oftentimes find that they moved you know, from Ohio into Pennsylvania and then down into West, or over into West Virginia. And so you know, pay attention to that so that you can track the movements. Sometimes making a simple little timeline of the birth of the children and the, the construction of the family will help you to do that. Well, that's all I have prepared for you today. I hope that was useful information. If you're watching this presentation live, I'll be on chat for 20 or 30 minutes afterwards to answer any questions you may have. Um, if you're watching this archived presentation, feel free to email at ask at ancestry.com. Um, we do read all of those emails. Unfortunately, we're not able to respond to each of them individually, but what we do with those emails are prepare presentations like this because we know what challenges you're facing. It helps us understand what some of your research roadblocks are. And then you may be lucky enough to have us use one of your examples or one of your family members in a live stream broadcast or over on our Tumblr blog with um, Ancestry Anne where she answers specific questions in a lot of detail to help break through some of those brick walls. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. I hope you have fun climbing your family tree, no matter which direction you're going.